Well, good afternoon. I'm Mark Edwards. I'm the chairman and co-founder of uh, ViewMind. I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, digital biomarkers for precision brain health assessment, uh, which is the area that, that uh, we operate in. Um, I need the clicker. Uh, here we are. <laughs> so. so the first thing I'd like to do is uh, just to discuss the prevalence of brain health neurological issues. And I have a question for you. So how many people in the audience know of somebody who has some kind of neurological issue, which could include things like uh, depression, a concussion, Alzheimer's, um, mild cognitive impairment, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, I mean the list goes on, there's many neurological issues. So how many people actually know somebody or know somebody who knows somebody? So I, it's pretty much everybody in the, in the audience. It's a very prevalent uh, challenge. Uh, one in six people in the world suffer from a neurological disorder, according to the WHO, and 60% of these disorders go undiagnosed. And that percentage rises when you go to uh, underserved communities or to developing countries, the percentage goes up to 90% are undiagnosed. There's also a high level of misdiagnosis. So even when there is a diagnosis, in the case of multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's, it's about 20% of people who are diagnosed with those diseases don't actually have those uh, conditions. 30% in the case of Parkinson's. And a major depressive disorder goes up to 65%, and that, that's data from the NIH. So even if somebody is diagnosed and they're correctly diagnosed, there's also a challenge in terms of doing disease management, actually um, assessing how somebody's dealing with a particular drug and whether that is the right drug for them or whether they need a different dosage. And uh, it's a very subjective process. And really, what we need to provide physicians is, is more um, objective tools to be able to measure the exact impact of the drugs. So ViewMind has a, a novel technology for measuring uh, brain health. And we uh, access this information through the eye. The eye anatomically is part of the brain and it provides some unique access uh, to, uh, to brain health information. And I'm going to uh, just show you a, a short video, and I think this gives you a good introduction to the technology. And uh, so if we could just, uh, Manny, just move over to the video. in medical journals, but nobody's been able to build a robust diagnostic solution to tap into that signal from the brain, and that's what ViewMind has been able to do. The eye is, is the window, is a reflection of, of your brain, not only anatomically, but also functionally. The way it moves, the way that actually you can pay attention to somebody uh, or not. 
not the way that actually the eye moves are in different normal and abnormal you know brain uh, states really helps you to determine and diagnose specific diseases that are difficult to diagnose uh, otherwise since the last 30 years, we are relating different eye movements with specific cognitive functions and related areas of the brain. Currently, the analysis of eye movements allows your mind to identify how different diseases affect a person's health. Chemical biomarkers are uh, measuring the, the body chemistry, identifying, for example, if a protein is in spinal fluid. Digital biomarkers, on the other hand, are capturing information which is purely digital, and then the data can be analyzed and patterns can be extracted, which could provide an indication as to uh, whether somebody has a particular uh, issue or not. So a digital biomarker in the case of ViewMind is that we are capturing eye movement data. ViewMind is a medical device and it also includes digital health software. We don't make the hardware. Uh, the hardware is provided through a partnership with Hewlett Packard and we use a combination of their virtual reality headsets and the HP uh, virtual reality computers. We provide extended reality technologies as fundamental technologies and then our partner ViewMind develops specific solutions on top of those fundamental technologies uh, to improve the well-being of our customers. So for a VR setup, our solutions right now focus on PC-attached VR. We have a, a VR headset called the HP Reverb G2. These VR headsets attach to a laptop or a desktop computer with powerful enough uh, graphics that it can support virtual reality headsets. Assessing the person is a very simple process. Our product is in place of a VRS and eye tracking, a laptop and demand software. A patient undergoes a 15 minute test, then there is a loading into our servers, and an actual report is sent to the physician to access which can be things that they can use to make a proper diagnosis. I believe that we might have become the gold standard in neurological healthcare diagnosis, but I also believe in the future possibilities of the mind in making a significant contribution to the situational readiness of our nations, of our companies, and of our societies. I think the future of medicine is prevention. We are developing therapeutic options for people that present specifically actually brain diseases by being able to screen millions of patients and diagnose the ones at risk can be very, very impactful for, for society. Tools that are fast, quick to implement, and actually provide easy access to patients, you know, can really disrupt the way that we uh, diagnose and manage neurological disorders. We're very excited about the potential impact that the technology could have on millions of people's lives. So this is the uh, this is the headset, and um, the way the technology works is that the patient puts on the headset. Their eyes are exposed to a visual exercise. This exercise stimulates and activates specific regions of the brain. The exercise takes two to four minutes. There are maybe three exercises that are undertaken in a, in a battery of tests to look at different brain regions. During that time, we would have gathered 100,000 data points. And this data is fed into an artificial intelligence system in the cloud that correlates the patient's data with particular pathologies. The advantages of ViewMind is that, firstly, it's ultra-high sensitivity and specificity, the highest of any technology uh, that exists. It is, works independent of age, uh, culture, and education, which is very important, and a lot of the existing tests that I'm going to mention in a moment uh, have dependencies. It is non-invasive and affordable, and it also correlates to some of the gold standard tests to look at physical brain health, such as a lumbar puncture or CSF, a PT scan to look for beta amyloid or tau in the brain, an MRI, and EEG. 
It can also, because of its ultra-high sensitivity, be used for a preclinical diagnosis, so you can look many years even before symptoms present and actually see cognitive changes that are taking place. It's so sensitive you can even measure the impact of drugs on, on, uh, on the brain and how the brain is, is altering in different regions. And it is a platform that can be used for a, a variety of different neurocognitive or neurodegenerative disorders. So looking at some of the, the standard um, ways in which cognition and brain health are measured today, on the, the first column over here you have cognition. And pen, pen and paper testing is really the staple of how this type of testing is done, looking at memory functions, the way we process information. And uh, things like the mini mental is, is uh, one such test, or Adamsbrook test. There are some computer-based versions and iPad versions of the same tests, but they, they still, the, you know, the sensitivity and specificity is better, but it's not dramatically better. And then you have various different biomarker tests and neuroimaging tests such as a PT, CSF, MRI. Um, evoke potential is used for certain conditions like multiple sclerosis and blood assay assays are also uh, used as well. The, the challenge with these tests is that whilst they produce good results, they are invasive and they are expensive. You know, PT is perhaps uh, you know, four and a half thousand dollars, a CSF is about three and a half thousand dollars, MRI maybe about three thousand dollars. So they're very expensive tests and really you're only going to have that test maybe once a year and probably only if, if symptoms have already presented. It's certainly not going to be done in a, in a preclinical stage. So ViewMind has the advantage that it provides uh, ultra-high sensitivity and specificity beyond anything else that, that uh, exists, and it provides a correlation with all of these other tests, yet it's not invasive and it's affordable. And in addition, one of the key things that where ViewMind is really, uh, really excelling in, in a, you could say, a new category is what we call uh, evidence-based disease management. So it's the ability to provide the physician with data, objective data about the patient, how they're responding, how they're responding to a drug, and being able to make clinical decisions that could alter and improve the, uh, the patient's journey and the, the course of treatment. So in terms of clinical validation, uh, just to uh, give you just a little snapshot of this, we've done a lot of studies. We've done studies on over 2,000 subjects in 30 different studies in three continents. Um, we are particularly focused on multiple sclerosis. That's our primary area. Uh, we also have done a lot of work in the area of Alzheimer's and mild cognitive impairment. Um, and then we, we are doing studies, some other studies in other areas. Parkinson's disease, we're about to uh, start a study in Asia, and in this area, a large study with the government. Um, depression, differentiating between unipolar disorder and bipolar uh, disorder, which is a very, difficult, uh, very difficult to differentiate between the two. Uh, long COVID is another um, interesting area. I'm going to mention more about that in a minute. Uh, we're just about to start a big study in Europe with the Luxembourg government. It was just announced a couple of days ago. And uh, we've also been using ViewMind as a digital therapeutic and showing how we can use the technology to enhance cognition and then may measure the minor alterations uh, in, in uh, cognitive functions as a result. So just to give a, a, a few examples of, of some of the results we've had in, in certain studies, um, one study was to see if we were able to predict if somebody would convert to mild cognitive impairment, if they would co convert in the future to Alzheimer's disease. And uh, this is a, 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 um, a prospective study, so it was done over a period of, of four years. We started with a 105 subjects. We identified 63 had mild cognitive impairment. And we predicted that in the future, uh, 34 of these subjects would convert to Alzheimer's disease and that 29 would not convert. It's obviously very, you know, these 29 that would not convert, chances are they would convert to something else, like could be Parkinson's, frontal temporal dementia, um, Lewis body, some, some other type of dementia. And over the course of the, uh, the next number of years after year one, year two, year three. So by year three, 32 of the 34 we said would convert had converted, indicating a positive predictive value of 94%. And none of the ones that we said would not convert had converted, which is a 100% negative predictive value. So this is beyond any technology that exists uh, in the world today to do this type of uh, analysis. 
Um, and uh, this was presented at the AAIC, the Alzheimer's Association International Conference, in 2020 and 2021. Um, another study that, uh, just to give you some highlights of, oh, I went too far. Um, this is a, a very interesting study that was done of patients that have a genetic disorder called familial Alzheimer's disease, which means that unfortunately they will unavoidably develop Alzheimer's between the age of 48 and 60. And we're able to study them at, earlier in the pathology between the ages of 28 and 35. So we know what their future journey will be, and we can study them you know, up to 20 years uh, before symptoms. They've had a whole battery of different uh, assessments. They've had PETs, uh, uh, MRIs, uh, CSF, and so on. And we were able to differentiate in a blind study the FAD subjects from c healthy controls with a 96% sensitivity and a 98% specificity up to 20 years before clinical symptoms. And the reason why this is very important, a very, a very profound uh, result, is that the pathology of familial Alzheimer's is similar to generic or sporadic Alzheimer's. So you start to accumulate beta amyloid plaques in specific areas of the brain, and that correlates exactly to what we're uh, picking up and detecting with our analysis. This is going to be presented at a plenary at AAIC 2022, this year in San Diego, in the end of July, and it will be with um, uh, the PIs on this are, are very well known, some of the leading uh, KOLs, key opinion leaders in the world in, the, in this field. Another study um, in, uh, to, to reference is in the area of long COVID. And um, so in this study, what we're doing is assessing the neurocognitive deficiencies in subjects who have recovered from COVID six months out. Now, there's a lot of evidence already accumulating that people, a lot of people are getting neurological issues, long COVID, brain fog, and so on. The Lancet um, did a, a study of 234,000 people and found that 33.6% had neurological impacts six months out. So we were measuring people who had recovered. They weren't hospitalized, so they were, let's say, uh, doing better than many, many people have. And, uh, and the results are really profound in that what we found is six months out, when solving tasks, that they were between 44 and 49 percent slower in terms of solving tasks. And, and one, of the, one of the worries and, and, and concerns, I think, in this area is that it's known that long COVID causes neuroinflammation, inflammation of the brain tissue. And neuroinflammation is one of the things that is also a factor, part of the uh, uh, pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. Now, we don't necessarily understand all of these uh, connections uh, right now. Uh, there's more studies and work that needs to be done, and that is one of the reasons why we're about to start a major pivotal study uh, with the Luxembourg uh, Ministry of, of uh, Economy and the Institute of Health to assess this in more detail and uh, provide evidence-based data for clinicians to be able to help treat people who have this condition. These are some of the publications that we've done. We have uh, many publications in, in different journals. There's also many that will be uh, coming out over the course of this year. We have ANMAT and CE approval, which is a European and Latin American approval, and we're in the process of, of pursuing FDA approval, which we, ex we, we hope to get towards the latter part of this year. And in terms of uh, you know, some of the momentum that we have, we're, we're deploying in hospitals. We have some major US hospitals that, are, uh, that we're engaging with, and hospitals in Europe, also in uh, Latin America. Um, we uh, were awarded, uh, very uh, humble to be awarded by Frost & Sullivan, the market analyst, uh, with a Best Practices Award last uh, year. Uh, we have uh, a growing amount of clinical validation taking place. Um, we, you know, by the end of this year, our run rate in terms of clinical studies is going to be in a month uh, equivalent to, to half of what we've done over the course of five years. So things are really ramping very quickly. And we do have a number of partnerships, uh, one of which is with Hewlett Packard on a, on a global basis. We're one of their key uh, partners um, uh, using that technology. So in summary, uh, ViewMind is a company that is offering a, a novel approach and a, I think a very high impact, important uh, solution so that we can be more proactive about 
managing our brain health rather than reactive and just dealing with issues when we have symptoms um, by providing evidence-based neurodegenerative disease management. So thank you very much. And uh, I think I have left a reasonable amount of time for, for questions. So open to any questions that uh, the audience have. Yeah, first of all, that was really interesting. Um, I work in uh, inflammatory biomarkers, and this is, this is phenomenal. Uh, I was curious about, uh, you were saying the affordability, uh, that's the, a pr still a pretty wide range. Um, are you talking affordable in terms of implementation in a large hospital, or inf affordable in terms of implementation for a, like a small neighborhood clinic? Um, both. I mean, I mean, uh, we see eventually um, that initially our focus is to work with, let's say, neurologists, specialist neurologists who are offering this uh, this solution in a clinic. Um, but there are. I think, for, you know, from what I presented, you can see that there are some significant implications in terms of, ultimately, we see this being part of the, the battery of tests that you have as an annual health checkup by a primary care physician. And so we see, ultimately, this is going to be in, in every doctor's office and be part of that, you know, from maybe from the age of 35 onwards, this will be included in that annual uh, set of tests that you, would, uh, that you might have. But initially, right now, our focus is on the, on the neurologists and the hospitals uh, to build that uh, body of support from the, uh, you know, from the, from uh, neurologists initially, and uh, another gentleman. How quick is the report time in regards to say if you're using it as an initial assessment, and then say you want to do some treatment from a mental health perspective, say something like cognitive behavior therapy or di dialectical behavior therapy? and then doing a reassessment, say, three, four weeks down the road yeah. to see if there's any improvement or change? Yes, so that's a, that's a great question. And I, I sort of two parts of the question, I think, firstly, how quickly uh, is, the, is the report generated? Um, the report is, is the deliverable. That's, that's what we provide the physician. It provides information about how different cognitive domains are performing. Uh, it provides an overall sort of assessment. It also provides a, an assessment by, by a brain region, and it also has some data so that you can see how the individual has performed the test. So the physician doesn't actually need to be present for the test to be undertaken. It could be a, you know, somebody else, a technician, a nurse, or somebody who's doing the test, and the, the doctor can see exactly how the test was performed even though they weren't actually there. The, the report itself is generated in, you know, in a matter of uh, you know, a few minutes. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's in the cloud, uh, it's being automatically generated, and then the physician can access it from anywhere through a secure web portal. And uh, they would have a login and they'll be able to access the data uh, from there. In terms of the second part of your question about uh, sensitivity, it is inc one of the key things I, I'm personally very excited about is that this is ultra high sensitivity and specificity. And we see this being used for evidence-based uh, treatment. And, and we, you know, if you're having a drug, somebody might get reassessed in a month. It could be three weeks, it could be a month, it could be a couple of months. And the same, you know, if they're having some uh, C CBT, they could, be, they could be reassessed in a, in, a, in a relatively short period of time, and we'll be able to see changes because of the sensitivity. Uh, and we're providing the results in a quantitative way. So rather than like, uh, you know, if you're familiar with, say, mini mental tests, and you get a, like a number, you know, 35 or something like this, this is, this is providing a much more fine-grained uh, data that is, you know, a scale between 0 and 100. And the other thing is that we're measuring certain cognitive domains that you just couldn't measure previously. Previously. I mean, there's no test today that can measure, for example, how quickly you're processing information. Um, but because we're looking at the eye and eye movements, which uh, and we're looking in milliseconds, we're looking at the, we're not aware, but the way we view information is that we don't linearly sort of move around, uh, you know, in a, a page or, or a room. Our eyes jump and they jump very, very rapidly, and they continuously make these jumps backwards and forwards. And these are happening hundreds of times a second, and we're not aware of this. And you know, somebody looking at a person wouldn't notice or wouldn't be able to see that. But we're, we're capturing all of that, and so uh, you know, we can provide that, that sort of very sensitive performance information about the speed of reaction that somebody's having to, to some of the tests that we have.
Any other questions? Was there That's a very good question. Is, is, there a, is there a change depending on who is giving the test? The answer is no. I mean, it's been designed to take that out of the equation. Not only to take who's giving the test out of the equation, but actually the age, education, um, and culture of the person. Because, you know, for example, if you're doing a mini mental test, that can be very much influenced by the person giving the test. It can be influenced by the age, education, and culture of the person who's being assessed. Um, and it's very important to take that away because we, w we want objective uh, data. So our technology works in a way where um, you, could work, you could use it in a poor village in Africa or you could use it in a cosmopolitan city, you know, New York City or San Francisco, you would get the same results. And it doesn't matter who, who does the test. And the physician can see exactly how the test was performed because we provide some of the raw data about about the eye movements that they can see exactly did the person did they follow the you know follow the test in the way that they should have done it it becomes very 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 clear very quickly to you know be able to see that okay yeah so uh, Great question. So the, the question is, what if the patient has comorbidities? And um, one, of the, one of the challenges with many, for example, dementias is that comorbidities is often a factor. There are often more than one thing uh, going on. And so one of, the, one of the powerful things that we can do with the technology is that we can rule things out and we can say, this person does not have Alzheimer's. Uh, this person does not have Parkinson's. Uh, this person does not have multiple sclerosis. So we can, we haven't sort of covered everything, of course, at this point. We're still, we're amassing data all the time. But we can uh, significantly contribute towards doing a differential diagnosis and eliminating uh, certain things that, that somebody has or, or, inclu or including them in, into, the, uh, in, into the, um, the assessment and the diagnosis of that particular uh, patient's uh, co you know, condition. Any other questions? This gentleman. Did you say that this could work in remote areas? Yeah. Constraints, I mean, some of the digital solutions I had, you may need to How How would this solution work in areas where internet is constrained or stuff like that, or is it just local to the device from the headset to the and then you can go back to the connected to the main internet. Okay, so, so the question is about the, uh, how would this work in a remote location where maybe there's um, connectivity constraints? And uh, so uh, the technology works locally and captures the data. It does need internet access at some point to upload the data to the cloud, but it doesn't have to be in real time. So if, if, you, if you went to a remote village where there was no internet, you captured the data, next time the computer was connected to the internet, the data would get uploaded uh, for processing. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks.